Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. War itself is a monster. However, across the centuries, there have been reports by soldiers of actual monsters in the theater of war. Some experienced fighters even claim that they have been reduced to primal panic and dread when faced with creatures that, in their mind, should not exist. If the stories are true, soldiers deployed on the battlefield may just have one more fear than simply their human enemy. I'm Darren Marlar. And this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. A relatively recent report of a wartime monster sighting comes from an anonymous U.S. Army Special Forces squad member who was tracking a Taliban person of interest in the mountains of Afghanistan. The squad's objective at the time was to observe a village for several days, in the hopes of witnessing suspicious activity or persons which was hoped would inform and lead to a successful raid. The team comprised six men at the base, with two others whose job it was to observe the village at closer quarters. Over the course of a few days, suspicious activity was indeed witnessed by the squad, just not the sort they were expecting. Almost immediately, the team experienced technical problems. They had trouble maintaining radio contact due to static. Believing the magnetic content of the rocks to be the issue, the eyewitnesses described leaving the squad's base with some of the other men to reposition the SATCOM in an attempt to get a better signal. It was around dusk at the time. As they neared the SATCOM, one of the soldiers spotted a man in a white robe running through the rocks outside the village. Lacking reliable communication and worried about the mission being compromised, the men packed up their equipment and got ready to move. They were all on high alert as they trekked back to their outpost. Covering their tracks as they moved through the darkness, the witness stresses the carefulness with which they retreated. Regardless, every so often he claims he would catch a fleeting glimpse of something white moving in the distance. After a short while, he reported what he had seen to the others. An officer said he had seen the same thing. They were being followed. The sense of urgency and panic increased they were a small unit, completely exposed, without a means of communication. Not only that, the witness reports that everything felt strange, the air felt heavy and sort of sweet, the silence hummed loudly. Now enveloped in the darkness of night, the team put on their night vision goggles. With the world cast in a perfect green haze, they scouted their surroundings. The men could see nothing and no one moving behind them. However, the danger of the night was far from concluded. What the witness describes as having happened next 
is chilling. Hallucinations happen, but what happened was beyond comprehension. First we heard a sound like a huge airplane taking off, a loud low buzz that slowly increased in pitch. We had to yell over comms to hear each other. Everywhere I looked I kept seeing what looked like glowing eyes staring back at me, but once I would enter my focus on where I saw them, they would disappear. We were panicked. Everyone was holding their rifles at the high, ready. We were expecting some kind of ambush attack. Then it all just stopped. Everything got dark. The only thing I could hear was my breath and the blood pumping in my head. We stopped, dug into the side of the mountain, and performed SLLS – stop, look, listen, smell – for about ten minutes. Nothing. Not even bugs. The air and the land were silent. The team was thoroughly spooked and overcome with fatigue and eager to get back to camp. However, they were very aware that something waited in the darkness for them, something which very possibly had intentions to harm them. They moved quickly through the scrub until they were met by the sight of a man dressed in light-colored robes. The man was slowly making his way towards them. According to the witness, the way that he moved was unnatural. He seemed to pass through any and all obstacles in his way, as though they were made of air. He seemed to melt over and around the rocks. Through the nods night vision goggles, his eyes glowed. I scoped up on him and saw that he was looking directly at me. It was pitch black, there's no way he could have seen us from that distance without any kind of night optics. Suddenly he stopped. He picked up one of his limbs and held it in the air almost like he was waving at me. Then the arm melted back into his form like it wasn't an arm at all but some kind of extendable proboscis that was meant to look like an arm from a distance. I was about to ask the guys if they could see him when he suddenly disappeared. After he disappeared, the team, shaken and weary beyond words, were able to finally make their way back to the base. In the distance they saw lights flickering near the village they all but forgot about both this and the strange otherworldly man until a few days later. According to the witness, on that very night, the village they had been observing was raided. However, it was not the raid they had been working to inform. Apparently, the team had moved into the village, found it completely abandoned. They also found several men in the area where I'd seen the lights that night. The corpses had been ripped to shreds, and based on the sheer amount of blood, the general consensus was that there were more men that were killed there than just the bodies that were found. It went in the official records as a successful raid with several enemies, KIAs. Unofficially, no one has any idea what killed them. All I know is, whatever it was, it chose it chose those men and not us. Whatever the men saw that night and whatever happened to the village, remains unknown. The Lombards were a powerful Germanic tribe that ruled much of Italy from the 6th to the 8th century AD. Paul the Deacon, a scribe of the Lombards, tells of a strange story in their history. In their early days, the Lombards were confronted by an overwhelming tribal army, whose numbers greatly surpassed theirs. Their passage was barred. However, the leader of the Lombards thought of a plan. He spread a rumor that amongst his allies were a pack of savage, dog-headed man-beasts that waged unyielding warfare, drank human blood, and cannibalized themselves if they could not reach their enemy. The opposing army, not wanting to confront such an enemy, let the Lombards pass unmolested. With our modern sensibilities, most of us would look back upon these tribal peoples as being foolish for believing such a seemingly obvious lie. Yet at the time, and for much of human history, the existence of a race of dog-headed men was almost seen as a matter of fact. Various ancient Greek writers, including the father of history Herodotus, wrote of dog-headed men living in the mountains of India and Ethiopia. These canine men, also known as cynocephaly, have been described as hunting for a living and communicating by barking with one another. 
the Greek physician and historian Tisaias had this to say of the cynocephaly. They speak no language but bark like dogs and in this manner make themselves understood by each other. Their teeth are larger than those of dogs, their nails like those of these animals but longer and rounder. They cannot be defeated in war. St. Augustine suggested that these dog-headed men descended from Adam. Other saints, including St. Andrew and St. Bartholomew, have described such creatures as well, whose hound-like appearance disappears after baptism. For several centuries, theologians debated whether such dog-headed men, assuming they were real, had a soul and thus needed the Gospels taught to them. In the legend of King Arthur, it was told that he defeated a great army of dogmen on the hills of Edinburgh. Several medieval explorers have also claimed to have witnessed these dogmen. Writing in his travels, Marco Polo described encountering them on the Andaman Islands. They have heads like dogs, he said, and teeth and eyes likewise. In fact, in the face, they are all just like big, mastiff dogs. They have a quantity of spices, but they are a most cruel generation and eat everybody that they can catch, if not of their own race. Arguably most peculiar of all is the legend relating to the patron saint of travelers, St. Christopher. There are many different origin stories relating to St. Christopher. However, one story places his origins at a battle between the Romans and the savage North African tribe called the Marmorite, fought about 300 AD. This tribe was renowned for their ferociousness in battle, their cannibalistic tendencies, and, most of all, their heads being those of dogs. During the battle, which the Romans ultimately won, a giant beast of man was captured. He had a dog's head, and he was named Reprobus. Whilst the legend takes many forms from there, all agree that the warrior Reprobus converted to Christianity and took the name Christopher. After being a soldier of Christ for some time, he was martyred in Syria and was eventually sanctified. According to the medieval Irish passion of St. Christopher, this Christopher was one of the dog heads, a race that had the heads of dogs and ate human flesh. While this story is undoubtedly odd, the saint's canine head was such a well-known attribute that it inspired religious iconography for centuries. Stories of fearsome cynocephaly can also be found in Eastern sources, with the Buddhist missionary Wai Shang describing an entire island off the east coast of China being filled with a race of dog-headed men. Tales of dog-headed men, it seems, then, were commonplace. Everywhere around the world, people believed that there was indeed a savage race of men with the heads of dogs bent on murder and cannibalism. It is possible that many of these tales had their roots in ignorance and prejudice. However, when the enemies of the Lombards heard the rumor of the Cynocephaly that day, there was much for them to fear. The Battle of Chickamauga, which was fought on the 19th and 20th of December 1863 near Snodgrass Hill on the Tennessee-Georgia border, was one of the bloodiest battles of the American Civil War, second only to the Battle of Gettysburg in regards to the number of casualties. Indeed, it is said that so much blood was spilled on the battlefield that a creature of great malice was drawn to the devastation. A beast with green, glowing eyes is claimed to have haunted the land long before the arrival of the Civil War. After the Battle of Chickamauga, some reported seeing such a creature moving among the corpses near Snodgrass Hill. Such reports allegedly described the monster as being human-like with eerie green eyes and a huge, deformed jaw from which terrifying fangs protruded. In the centuries after the Civil War, visitors and rangers at the Chickamauga National Park have reported encounters with the same green-eyed creature. Some say that the entity is a ghost of a long-dead warrior. Others say that it is something else, something inhuman. Whatever the truth of the matter, the creature is known by those who report encountering it simply as 
Old Green Eyes. In the 1970s, two different and unrelated people had accidents near the same location in the park, having driven their cars off the road, wrecking them after seeing a pair of glowing eyes. However, one of the most notable encounters involved Edward Tinney, a park ranger. Speaking during an interview in 1981, he explained how he was walking through the park at around 4 a.m. sometime in 1976 when an inexplicable chill rushed over his body. The very next moment he watched as a green-eyed being stepped out of the darkness. In his own words, when it passed me I could see his hair was long like a woman's. The eyes, I'll never forget those eyes. They were glaring almost greenish-orange in color, flashing like some sort of wild animal. The teeth were long and pointed like fangs. I didn't know whether to run or scream or what. Then the headlights of an approaching car came blazing through the fog and the thing disappeared right in front of me. Unfortunately, like so many sightings of unknown creatures in wartime, the original accounts of Old Green Eyes have become obscure and largely forgotten, lost to the tides of time. Of all the sightings of mysterious creatures in wartime, none is more widely reported than the rock apes of Vietnam. Throughout the Vietnam War, fighters on both sides of the conflict regularly encountered large bipedal apes in the dense jungles. Bizarrely, Vietnam is home to no such wild apes. Even before conflict found its way to the jungles of Vietnam, there had been a long local tradition of strange creatures lurking in the wilderness. Various names have been assigned to the creatures by local peoples, including Batatut, Ujit, or Forest People. Particularly cited within the Vu Quang Nature Reserve, such stories describe muscular, bipedal beings with ape-like features around six feet tall, covered in reddish-brown hair, excepting the knees, soles of the feet, hands, and face. A commonly reported trait on the forest people is their displays of boldness and, on occasion, aggression. In Borneo, where the creatures are also claimed to exist, witnesses state that they do occasionally kill humans. Whilst the locals of these regions consider the creatures to be a fact of life, the Baratut was relatively unknown to the outside world. That was until war pushed its way into the creature's supposed habitat. Among American soldiers, the creatures were known as rock apes, supposedly because of their propensity to hurl rocks at soldiers. In the decades after the Vietnam War, veteran testimonies of encounters with these creatures are commonplace. One such veteran who served as an Airborne Infantry Squad leader with the 101st Airborne in 1968 to 1969 described seeing numerous brown and reddish-brown rock apes around the Ashaw Valley. Although sightings of the creatures were common, they were likely never killed. As silence was the rule of the jungle, unnecessary gunfire was to be avoided at all costs. According to the eyewitness, the higher echelons of command wanted confirmed body counts and not mysterious creature sightings. As such, many rock ape sightings were unreported at the time. Another testimony comes from Michael Kelly, who served from 1969 to 1970. In the year 2000, he described how eight rock apes surprised a squadron of his platoon, resulting in open fire being launched at the creatures. At first believing the mysterious apes to be the enemy, being the correct height, they looked very much like soldiers in khaki, the firing had been non-stop as the creatures hurled themselves through the trees. In Kelly's own words, "...all except one was light brown to reddish brown in color and about three and a half to four feet tall." One dark, almost black male remained fighting to protect the other's retreat as he was flying through the branches and rushing the men with his teeth bared. Despite the large amount of gunfire, when Kelly searched the site, he could not find a single drop of blood. 
With such a multitude of spectacular reports, one cannot help but wonder just what the rock apes were and if they are still around today. Over the years, a wide variety of unconvincing theories have been proposed. From the widespread use of highly hallucinogenic drugs like LSD by soldiers to mass confusion of mysterious, six-foot-tall bipedal so-called rock apes with Vietnam's largest native primate species, the critically endangered three-foot-long Tonkin snub-nosed monkey. It seems that, for now at least, the answer to this mystery will remain hidden deep within the dense jungles of Vietnam. In the Pacific theater of World War II, troops reported witnessing peculiar flying humanoids. Described as possessing a pair of large, leathery wings like a bat, these creatures were said to have been spotted close to military installations on numerous occasions. Silent and shy as they were reported to be, military eyewitnesses could not escape the unnerving feeling that these unearthly beings were somehow observing them. Many of the alleged sightings date to around the time of the Battle of Okinawa in 1945. Years afterwards, reports of flying humanoids in the Pacific were still being made by soldiers. One such report came from Sinclair Taylor, a U.S. Air Force private who was on guard duty at Camp Okubo near Kyoto, Japan in 1952. The sound of the creature's wings first drew the private's attention. To begin with, he thought he was looking at a giant bird. However, as it flew closer, it became clear that it wasn't. According to Taylor's testimony, the enigmatic being had the body of a man about seven feet tall. It also had a seven-foot wingspan. After having flown closer to the private, the creature stopped and hovered in the air. Panicked, Taylor began firing his weapon at the flying creature. When he looked back at the spot where the winged beast had been, it had vanished. No blood, cadaver, or any other physical evidence was left behind. Even more bizarre is the fact that Taylor was not the only witness to this creature. It has been reported that when he declared the incident to his sergeant, it was revealed that another guard had witnessed the exact same creature the year before. Although Private Sinclair Taylor had no knowledge of the previous sighting and had no contact with the other eyewitness, the two descriptions of the winged creatures were astonishingly similar. Theories as to what Taylor and others saw include secret military projects and the misidentification of local wildlife. Misidentification suggestions include crows, which are reported to be much larger in Japan than in other parts of the world. Certainly, in some countryside areas, crows with a wingspan twice the size of the typical carrion crow are described by rural farmers. These super-sized birds are also reported to be more reserved and less vocal than the common crow, which fits with descriptions of alleged flying humanoids. This being said, misidentification of crows or other large birds does not account for the alleged human characteristics of these creatures, nor does it explain their seemingly unnatural ability to survive rapid gunfire, as reported by Sinclair Taylor. As such, the true nature of the flying humanoid creatures of Japan remains a mystery. When Weird Darkness Returns You've heard of the gunfight at the OK Corral, but that was men versus men. To get really exciting, you need true stories of gunfights between men and extraterrestrials. And on Ocracoke Island, there is a small channel of water known as Teach's Hole, named after Edward Teach, and where it is said Edward met his end, and his ghost still lingers there. And if Edward Teach doesn't sound familiar to you, it could be that you know him better as Blackbeard. These stories are up next.
Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. One of the most controversial of all of Bob Lazar's claims, made after he allegedly briefly worked in late 1988 at a portion of Area 51 called S-4, is that he read a series of highly classified documents on various aspects of the UFO phenomenon. One of those documents, Lazar maintained, told a strange and sinister story of a violent confrontation between security personnel at Area 51 and a group of aliens that were in residence and working at S-4 alongside a scientific team. It was a confrontation that reportedly resulted in more than a few deaths, far more than a few. Lazar had admitted that he cannot say for sure that the briefing papers he read were the real thing. He has acknowledged that they may have been nothing but disinformation designed to swamp him with both real and bogus material. Why might the project leaders at Area 51 do such a thing? Simple. If there were concerns that Lazar might blow the whistle on what he knew, which, as history has shown, he did in 1989, mixing up the truth with a more than liberal amount of lies might have an adverse effect on his credibility. It should be noted that's exactly what happened. That said, although he cannot say for sure that the documentation was the real deal, he does recall the contents of the material in relation to this firefight situation. According to Lazar, the deadly confrontation occurred at some point in 1979 in the S-4 facility. Lazar said, I believe the altercation came about in 1979 or some time like that, and I don't remember exactly how it was started, but it had something to do with the security personnel. The aliens were in a separate room, I think it had something to do with the bullets the security guards were carrying, and somehow they were trying to be told that they couldn't enter the area with the bullets, possibly because it was hazardous. The bullets could explode through some field or whatever. Lazar continued that despite the warning, one of the security guards did indeed enter the room with the bullets, something which resulted in a violent and lethal response from the aliens. Lazar recalled that the papers he read described how the security personnel were all quickly killed by head wounds. The same fate befell a group of scientists on the program, too. Timothy Good, who interviewed Lazar at the height of the controversy surrounding his claims, said, "...the incident is said to have led to the termination of an alien liaison at the Nevada test site." It's important to note here that there is a variation to this story not from Lazar, who stuck to his story which he read out at S-4, but from a man named Paul Benowitz, who in the late 1970s began digging into claims that an alien base did exist below the New Mexico town of Dulce. From intelligence personnel at Kirtland Air Force Base Albuquerque, Benowitz learned of a story of a fatal encounter between hostile aliens and a security team in the lower levels of the Dulce base. The different location given to Benowitz 
is just about the only difference between what Lazar was told and what Benowitz was told. Clearly, both scenarios cannot be true, something which means we must give deep consideration to the possibility that the papers Lazar read were not the real deal. They may well have been disinformation. So might have been the data provided to Paul Benowitz. In other words, there is a strong likelihood that both tales were fabricated and fed to Lazar and Benowitz as a means to confuse the truth surrounding what is really going on at Area 51, and which may actually have nothing to do with real aliens, hostile or not. On Ocracoke Island is a small channel of water known as Teach's Hole. This inlet is reported to be the spot where the pirate Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard, preferred to anchor his ship. It is also said to be where he met his end, and some say his ghost haunts the spot to this day. Blackbeard roamed the Atlantic from around 1716 until 1718, robbing ships from the West Indies to the Carolinas. He had a reputation for unbridled ferocity. When Blackbeard went into battle, he strapped multiple pistols and multiple cutlasses to his body, most frightening of all, he wove fuses into his long black beard and set them on fire just before he stepped onto the captured ship. This towering figure, armed to the teeth, sporting a sparking, flaming beard, must have been absolutely terrifying. Ship's captains would surrender without a shot being fired. Blackbeard's reign on the high seas came to an end November 22, 1718. Virginia Governor Alexander Sportswood sent a ship commanded by John Maynard down to the North Carolina coast to track down and kill Blackbeard. Maynard surprised Blackbeard and a skeleton crew anchored at Teach's Hole. In the ferocious battle that followed, Blackbeard was shot five times and stabbed no less than twenty. The pirate crew was all killed or captured. Blackbeard's head was chopped off and hung from the bowsprit of Maynard's ship. The pirate's headless body was thrown overboard. Legend has it that the headless body swam around Maynard's ship three times before sinking below the waters. Ever since then, it has been said that Blackbeard's ghost haunts the spot known as Teach's Hole. Many people have reported seeing a strange light moving beneath the water in the cove, this ghostly light is thought by some to be Blackbeard's spirit, swimming through the waters, searching for his missing head. There are those who believe that on stormy nights you can hear Blackbeard's voice calling out in the wind. On nights when the angry wind is roaring and the hard rain is coming down, many people have heard a horrible roaring coming from this hidden cove. They say that it is an unearthly noise that sounds like a pained, human voice bellowing, where's my head? While his reign of terror on the seas was short, Blackbeard's legacy lives on in the legends of North Carolina. We're also learning even more about this frightening pirate every day, ever since the discovery of the wreck of the Queen Anne's Revenge. Archaeologists and historians have been working on recovering and restoring artifacts from this sunken ship captained by the notorious pirate, and we're discovering fascinating details of what life was like on an 18th century pirate ship. While Blackbeard's viciousness has gone down in history, these stories may be a fact of history being written by the winners. Except for the final battle, there's no record of Blackbeard ever having killed anyone. The show, with the massive arsenal and flaming beard, may have been deliberately designed to avoid a fight. Blackbeard seems to have understood that having a reputation for being a bloodthirsty murderer could save you the trouble of actually being a bloodthirsty murderer. And while pirates are considered to be bad guys of history, it's hard not to sympathize with the pirates over the British Navy. Pirate crews were better treated and better paid than Navy crews. Furthermore, pirate crews were on their ships by choice, as opposed to the Navy crews, 
many of whose members would have been pressed into service. Pirate ships were also essentially democratic institutions. The pirate captain would be elected by the crew and generally selected on the basis of competence and fairness as a leader. The captain's decisions on where and when to sail would be put to a vote, and his authority became absolute only during battle. This was a stark contrast to the British Navy at the time, where the captaincy of a ship was based more on being born to the right family than on any ability to competently lead a crew. It's also important to remember what the pirates were stealing and from whom. A large portion of the vessels passing through the Atlantic at this time were holding enslaved human beings as cargo. When intercepting a slave ship, pirate crews would routinely free those otherwise destined for a life of unimaginable misery. These men would be offered the opportunity to join the ship's crew. With chances of their being able to return home being tragically small, it was an offer many of them took up. Records show that as much as half of any given pirate ship's crew in the early 18th century would have been composed of freed Africans. Even Blackbeard's trusted second-in-command, who died fighting with him at Teach's Hole, was one of these men, known to us only as Black Caesar. While many pirates did kill and plunder, they were killing and plundering from people who were themselves killing, plundering, enslaving, and exploiting lands which had been invaded and were held by force. What seemed to offend the authorities so much about the pirates was not their tactics, but that somebody else was getting a cut of the action. Your Haunted Lives – True Tales of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey, a collection of creepy, often downright chilling true experiences of the paranormal submitted by visitors to the My Haunted Life 2 website. The tales have been carefully selected and edited and range from apparitions to hauntings to demons through to the downright bizarre. This terrific collection of true stories of the paranormal will keep you looking over your shoulder. Your Haunted Lives – True Tales of the Paranormal by G. Michael Vasey Narrated by Darren Marlar Here are a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com The Ash Building on the corner of Green Street and Washington Place was a rather nondescript ten-story building. The owners, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, rented or subcontracted out the lower seven floors of the building to various other similar enterprises. They saved the eighth, ninth, and tenth floors for the Triangle Shirtwaist Company factory, which they operated to make ladies' blouses, then known as shirtwaists. Employees of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company were not allowed to leave the building by the main doors. At the end of the workday, they were required to go to the rear exit door, which was kept locked during the hours of operation for fear of theft. Here, the employees were routinely searched before leaving, lest they try to steal something. Since the young ladies who worked in the sweatshop only knew this one exit to get out in the event of a fire, terrible things occurred on these rear stairs. March 25, 1911 was a Saturday and a fine day according to all accounts. Most sweatshop workers in the city were released by lunchtime for their Saturday half-day off, including those who worked on the lower seven floors of the Ash Building. However, the owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company kept most of their employees hard at work until 5 p.m., most of the factory employees, nearly 500 women and 100 or so men, were at work that day. Most of the women were very young, ages 16 to 23, and very few of them spoke English. They were largely Italian, 
German, Russian, and Hungarian immigrants, and many of them were the primary wage earners for their families. The men employed there worked mostly in the capacity of office workers and management. Around 4.40 p.m., just 10 minutes before the end of the workday, cries of fire rang out on the eighth floor. No one ever learned exactly how the fire started, but most speculated that it was caused by a carelessly discarded cigarette or match. Within a few minutes, flames were pouring from windows at the top three floors of the Ash Building. Four fire alarms were sounded immediately, but the fire was already so intense that the first five women to jump to their deaths did so before even the first fire truck had arrived. Of the two elevators in the building, only one was in working order. A few minutes after the fire began, the only stairwell was full of flames and smoke, making it impossible to flee using that route. Thomas Gregory, an elevator operator from another building who was on his way home that day, ran into the building and made three more trips with the elevator before it broke down. He described leaving masses of terrified, panic-stricken people trying to fight their way onto the elevator, but was only able to take 15 or so people on each trip. Even though the elevator was no longer operating, the shaft doors were forced open and several people attempted to escape by sliding down the elevator cables. At least two people were successful in their attempt. A young woman, later pulled from the shaft alive, said she passed out on her way down the cables and had no memory of what happened next, but she believed that she survived because she landed on several of the dead bodies of her fellow workers, which cushioned her fall. Another man reported using the same cables to flee. Unfortunately, as he slid down, the body of a young woman falling from above knocked him from the cables and he fell the final few floors. After the fire, 25 bodies were pulled from the bottom of the elevator shaft, many of whom had simply jumped to their deaths to escape the flames. Both Harris and Blank, the building's owners, were in the building when the fire started, along with Blank's children and their nanny. All escaped by making their way to the roof, a means of escape that was not known to most of the factory workers. The doors to the roof were kept locked on all but the top floor. About 200 workers did eventually make their way to the roof, most of them from the 10th floor. The New York University Law School building was located just across a small courtyard but was one story higher. As the fire raged, several law students led by Charles Kremer and Elias Cantor rushed to the aid of the victims. They tied two short ladders together so that the victims could climb to the roof of their building. Kremer climbed down onto the lower roof to help them up the ladder, and in this way they were able to save 150 men, women, and girls. Kremer then made his way down into the 10th floor to look for more survivors. He saw only one young girl, her hair ablaze. She ran toward him screaming and then fainted in his arms. He put out her burning hair, then carried her to safety, believing there to be no one else surviving left behind on that floor. Meanwhile, at the other end of the roof, about 50 people had gathered and were fighting to scale the five feet to the roof of the adjoining building. Several of the law students reported seeing men kicking and biting the women and girls, knocking them out of the way as they escaped to safety. After the fire department arrived, many attempts were made to save trapped or falling victims. Unfortunately, their ladders only reached a little above the sixth floor. Several people tried to jump to the ladders but none were able to catch hold and all fell to their deaths. Safety nets were also employed but to little or no avail. The great height was just too much and many of the nets split or were shredded as bodies fell through them crashing to the pavement. In one case, a young girl was caught in a net but three others who jumped just after landed on her and all four toppled onto the ground dead. A few bystanders tried to stretch blankets or tarps, but the results were nearly all the same. The number of people saved in this manner could be counted on one hand. One woman fell with such force that she ripped through a safety net and crashed through the thick glass vault in the sidewalk, finally coming to rest in the basement of the building. Several rescue workers were injured when falling bodies struck them. 
people were falling faster than the firefighters could get into position to try and catch them. The firefighters' rescue efforts were further hindered by the growing number of corpses strewn about the sidewalks, making it difficult for them to move the safety nets. The bodies were left lying where they fell until later that evening. As the firefighters were busy fighting the fire, it was believed none of those who had fallen could still be alive. A few hours later, however, a young woman was pulled from a pile of bodies, still breathing. A great cheer arose as she was loaded into an ambulance. Sadly, though, she died a few minutes later. As the upper floors of the building burned, a crowd of thousands gathering in the streets below bore witness to the carnage that was unfolding before them. They screamed in horror as they watched helpless. Many eyewitness reports of the tragic deaths of the people who fell to their deaths from the windows of the Washington Place and Green Street sides soon followed. Some jumped, some were thrown or pushed, and others were forced out by the panic-stricken crowds shoving their way toward the windows. A majority of those who fell did so with burning clothing and hair. Some continued to burn as they lay on the sidewalk until they were extinguished by the water dripping down from the fire hoses, their blackened bodies left lying there until late in the evening. Five young women on the Green Street side of the building climbed out onto the windowsill, wrapped their arms around each other, and jumped together. They crashed through the sidewalk cover into the basement, their clothes and hair burning as they fell. Another girl leaped very far out, but her dress got tangled up in some wires, and she was left suspended, high above, as the crowd watched, unable to help. Eventually, her dress burned through and she fell to her death. A man on the same side was seen from an adjacent building, running from window to window, picking up women and throwing them out the windows. Eventually, when no other women were left, he himself climbed onto the ledge, paused a moment, then jumped. It was never known if he believed that there would be nets to catch them or if he was trying to shorten their suffering. A young girl of about 13 was seen hanging by her fingertips from a ninth-floor windowsill for a few minutes. Then the fire reached her fingers and she fell into a waiting net, only to be crushed by two other women who fell immediately after her, adding all three to the death list. Some of the girls who jumped from the Washington Place side crashed through the vault light in the sidewalk. As women continued to fall or jump from the same window, their bodies eventually created a hole nearly five feet in diameter. Later in the evening, firefighters pulled several partially nude and burned bodies from this hole. Another pair of girls climbed out of a window on the ninth floor, overlooking Green Street. The older of the two seemed calm and composed as she tried to subdue the younger girl as she shrieked and twisted with fright. As the crowd called to them not to jump, the older girl wrapped her arms around her and pulled her back toward the building. The younger girl, in her panic, twisted free, took a few steps away, and then she jumped. The older girl remained standing on the ledge until the flames came so close that her hair was scorched. She looked skyward, placed her arms to her sides, and jumped straight down feet first. Her name was Bertha Weintraut, and she was the girl who was later found alive, if only for a few minutes, buried amid a pile of corpses on the sidewalk. Six girls, after getting to a window on the ninth floor, made their way out onto an eight-inch wide ledge that ran the length of the building. Slowly, they edged their way along this ledge, more than 100 feet above the ground, toward a swinging electric cable. When all had arrived, they grabbed the cable simultaneously in an attempt to swing to the safety of the adjacent building. The cable snapped as they swung out and all six perished below. A few windows down on the same floor, a man and a woman appeared on the sill. The man kissed, then hugged the woman, threw her to the street, and jumped himself. Both were killed. Just around the corner, from another window, a young girl, a man and a woman, and two other women with their arms wrapped around each other leaped to the ground together. The young girl was found alive after her fall and was rushed to the hospital where she died upon arrival. A small group of men tried to make a human bridge between the burning building and the window of another building, 
They were successful in saving a number of women, but eventually the weight of the women became too great and the bridge broke, the center man tumbling to the ground with a broken back. The fire was extinguished within an hour, and by 7 p.m., less than two hours after it started, firefighters were able to force their way up the stairs and into the burned floors. They reported that 50 roasted bodies were found on the ninth floor alone. The charred bodies of 19 victims were found piled against locked doors, and 25 more were found huddled together in a cloakroom. Each body, as it was found, was carefully lifted from the burned surroundings, wrapped in cloth, and hoisted to the ground using a pulley system. They were then taken to one of a hundred wooden coffins lining the street. The bodies were then moved to the morgue at Bellevue Hospital or the Charities Pier Morgue. One unnamed reporter wrote in the New York Times that the remains of the dead, it is hardly possible to call them bodies because that would suggest something human, and there was nothing human about most of these, were being taken in a steady stream to the morgue for identification. Fire Chief Edward F. Croker, one of the first men to re-enter the building following the fire, left the building in obvious distress, stating that in all his years he had never seen anything like what he had seen on those upper floors. The police estimated that as many as 200,000 people, devastated family and friends as well as the morbidly curious public, entered the makeshift morgue at the pier and filed past the over 100 wooden coffins containing bodies that had been recovered. They walked past the bodies that were at least partially recognizable in the hope of finding a lost loved one. Tens of thousands were turned away by the police in an attempt to keep more of the general public away. Over 40 human forms too badly burned to be recognizable were covered with a white canvas tarp with the hopes that they might be identified through trinkets, jewelry, or articles of clothing. Stories of unbelievable anguish were published in newspapers across the country. A young girl was identified by a family heirloom signet ring found clinging to the charred flesh of a badly burned body. A young woman screamed as she collapsed after identifying her fiancé by his ring, having become engaged only the night before. She asked if a watch had been found with the body. When she was given the watch, she opened it and gazed upon her own portrait. A man having waited in line for over five hours identified his daughters by their clothing. After collapsing with grief, he attempted to kill himself on the spot. He was restrained by police until he calmed down enough to continue looking for his wife, also lost in the fire. A man with a fresh burn on his cheek identified his brother. He told the police that he and his brother had fought the fire, standing side by side with buckets of water. A man who had barely escaped with his own life identified his fiancée by her engagement ring. In her hand, she still clutched her handbag. Her weekly wages of $3 remained inside, intact. A sobbing brother stumbled away from the mangled bodies of his two sisters, left propped up in their coffins to search for their mother. The fire took his entire family. As a growing number of people became hysterical or suicidal, a makeshift hospital was set up at the pier to deal with this unexpected problem. Doctors and nurses from Bellevue Hospital worked for days trying to help keep those grieving family members from being added to the list of lives stolen by the fire. 31 victims remained unidentified after the last of the survivors claimed their family and friends. The Hebrew Free Burial Association paid for the burial of 23 of these victims in a special section of Mount Richmond Cemetery. The remaining eight bodies were interred in the Cemetery of the Evergreens in Brooklyn. As the blaze began, the only safety measures within the Ash Building available to those still inside were 27 buckets of water and one fire escape that collapsed almost immediately. Most of the exits were locked, and those that weren't opened inward so that they remained closed under the crush of people pushing toward the doors. It was not the 95 charred bodies found inside the building that so outraged the public, but rather the heaps of bodies along the sidewalk and rows of mostly young girls lying dead in the street. By the end, 53 people had jumped, 
fallen or were pushed from the upper floors, and thousands of people were there to witness each one of them fall and strike the pavement. The average age of those killed in the fire was 19. The public outrage was carried like a wave across the country as reports and pictures of the tragedy appeared in newspapers everywhere. The resulting public pressure proved to be too much to overcome, and dramatic changes were in store for the existing fire codes and their enforcement in the workplace. The New York State Legislature formed the Factory Commission in 1911, which developed many requirements linked directly back to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, such as all exit doors must be left unlocked during operating hours, and sprinklers were to be installed if a factory employed more than 25 people. The memories of the young women who perished in that terrible fire resulted in a major change in the way many people thought about protecting workers. Prior to the fire, the government left businesses alone regarding the safety of their workers. Afterwards, the government had little choice but to begin instituting sweeping safety laws that changed history for American workers. In the end, no one was held accountable for the Triangle deaths. In December of 1911, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, the Ash Building owners and Triangle Shirtwaist Company owners, were charged and tried for manslaughter. Despite a mob of people outside the courthouse chanting, murderers, murderers, the two were acquitted of all charges by the jury after only two hours of deliberation. Twenty-three individual civil suits for damages against the company were settled for an average of $75 per life lost. Blank and Isaac completed their association with the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory by filling an insurance claim in excess of their losses, garnering them a profit from the fire of more than $60,000, a hefty sum in 1911. Blank continued on in the clothing manufacturing business. He opened another factory on Fifth Avenue. In 1913, just two years after the Triangle Fire, he was arrested for locking the exit door in his factory during working hours. He was fined $20. The Ash Building still stands at the corner of Washington Place and Green Street, but its name has been changed to the Brown Building. No longer are the floors of that building home to sweatshops employing poor and desperate immigrant women and girls overworked and underpaid. Today, the Brown Building is full of young university science students, as it has become a part of the New York University as a science lab, the same university that was located next door and provided a means of escape to nearly 150 people fleeing the fire with the aid of many of the students. On the corner of the building, a plaque has been placed, commemorating the tragic events that took place on that site on March 25, 1911, and the lives lost that day. The Triangle Shirtwaist Fire continues as a turning point in United States history. There are other reminders of the fire for those who pay close enough attention. Even though the use of the building and the occupants have changed dramatically, bits and pieces of its history still linger many of these believed to be supernatural. It's not uncommon for the smell of smoke to waft through the halls of the upper floors, and more than once, fire warnings have passed through the building. On occasion, people have reported a different kind of odor accompanying the smell of smoke. This odor can only be described as that of burning flesh. Then the odors simply disappear as quickly as they began. Often doors that are supposed to be locked are found unlocked, sometimes within minutes of being locked. Could it be that the spirit of someone lost in the fire is trying to keep the current occupants from meeting the same tragic fate by being trapped behind a locked door in an emergency? A few people over the years have described a most peculiar experience. While sitting at a desk or workstation, they've seen, out of the corner of their eye, something large flutter downward past their window. Upon going to the window to look down and see what it was, there is nothing there. The most striking ghostly experience was related by Susan, not her real name, a secretary who worked in the building for many years. She explained that she had been working later than usual one evening, and by the time she left to go home, most of the other employees and students had already left. As she walked out of the building, she noticed a young woman walk past her 
with a slight stagger and a dazed look on her face. She was very dirty, and her hair and clothes appeared to be singed or burned. Susan called to her to see if she needed help, but the young woman didn't respond. She just kept walking and turned the corner. Susan, thinking that the woman might be injured or in trouble, ran after her, but upon turning the corner she was met by an empty sidewalk. The young woman had simply vanished. We will never know for sure if these occurrences are directly related to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. However, it does appear that the most important thing is that we never forget what happened there, nor the lessons learned. We may even get a little reminder now and then just to make sure. I've been working at a local Good Sense Subs in my town for almost two years now. This specific store has been experiencing strange phenomenon since before I started my work. Co-workers have claimed to be touched, heard their names called, and even seen strange apparitions. I wasn't a believer until I kept hearing my name being called, though the most horrifying thing happened to me on Easter about a year ago. I was told by management to come in and lay out the bread that would be baked the next day, and reluctantly agreed. No one wanted to come into the store alone. At about 7 o'clock that Easter night, I entered the store. It wasn't so bad, kind of relaxing, or so I thought. I was able to lay out the first tray of bread when I noticed it. As I was closing the freezer door, I saw what looked to be a face peering at me from around the corner in the store office. I jumped, not expecting to see a form, and it disappeared. Frightened slightly, I continued to lay out bread. I then heard an odd scraping noise. Immediately, I armed myself with the closest bread knife I could. Studying the area, I saw the face again. This prompted a full search of the store for intruders, but I found nothing. This is the single most frightening incident I have ever experienced, and I refused for months to be alone in the store at all. I've had several unusual experiences throughout my life. I like to say unusual instead of paranormal because of the skeptic in me. However, the most recent one occurred two years ago. At this time, my then fiancé, now husband, and I had moved in with my in-laws in order to save for our wedding and for college. I had two experiences at this house. My first experience occurred when I was home by myself. I'd just gotten out of the shower and across our narrow hallway to our bedroom. I dropped the towel to get dressed. I then heard a door handle jiggle somewhere inside the house. I instinctively picked up the towel to save everyone any embarrassment. I called out, hello, to see who had come home, but no one ever answered. I then walked out of the bedroom and searched the house, looking out into the driveway, but no one had come home. The second experience occurred when I was home with my in-laws. My husband was at band practice. We were in the living room watching TV. They have a large sectional couch. The shorter end of the eye shape faces directly into the hallway. Whoever sits in this area can turn their head and stare directly into the long hallway. Anyway, I was sitting in this spot when I turned my head to look for our dogs. When I turn my head, I see what I can best describe as a shadow cross from my bedroom to another room that's located directly across the hallway from my bedroom. It wasn't exactly a shadow, but a figure that had a few features of a person. It's difficult to describe because it looked soft and blurry like it was out of focus. I wondered for a second what my husband was doing before I remembered that he was at a practice across town. I turned to my in-laws and said, I think I just saw something cross from one room to the other. My father-in-law simply stated, oh, yeah, that happens sometimes. I told them I could have done with a warning.
Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. When you think of a mother, you think of someone who loves you unconditionally, a person to whom you've given your absolute trust. But what happens when that trust is violated again and again in the most grievous of ways? And what if the woman who tucks you in at night is a mother, a murderer, and a monster? Such was the case for the six children of Teresa Knorr life in the Knorr house had never been stable. A raging alcoholic, a negligent wife, and an abusive mother, Teresa Knorr had burned her way through four marriages by the time she was 30 years old. But it was her last divorce from Chet Harris, finalized the same year they wed, that sent her past the brink of madness. Suddenly, Teresa's drinking increased. Her neurosis worsened. Her violent behaviors escalated. Envious of her two eldest daughters, Teresa directed the brunt of her abuse at Sheila and Susan. Both girls met gruesome ends at their mother's hands. In 1984, Teresa burned Susan alive with the help of her teenage sons, Robert and William. Several unsuccessful murder attempts preceded the incident – a shot in the back, a stabbing, and a crude operation with an exacto knife. Teresa's motivation? she believed Susan had used magic to make her gain weight. Sheila was killed only a year later, after being locked in a closet without food or water for three days. Again, Teresa made wild claims to justify her actions. And again, Robert and William served as her brainwashed accomplices. After years of silence, Terry, the youngest of the Noor children, courageously brought her story to America's Most Wanted in 1993. An investigation was launched soon thereafter, in which her mother received two consecutive life sentences. At last, Teresa Knorr was brought to justice, but the scars she'd left behind would never fade. Back at the house on Bellingham Way, Teresa grew more reclusive, more unpredictable, and more violent but nobody outside of her immediate family knew anything about it. Though she had always been hard on her children, it was her last husband who finally turned her into a monster. She really went over the edge with Chet Harris, said Terry. After Harris, she dated for a little while, but then she got to the point where she wouldn't date or remarry or nothing. Terry's older brothers, William and Robert, agreed recalling that their mother's gradual transformation from angry disciplinarian to raging eccentric took place in the late 1970s. Sometime around when I turned 10 or 11 or so, she started becoming abusive, real short-tempered, William recalled. She stopped going out, seeing friends at all on any level. She got rid of the telephone because she didn't want any people calling. We weren't allowed to have anybody inside the house. When I was growing up, I hated the Brady Bunch because I knew that nobody lived like that," said Robert. I knew that because I knew what my family life was like. Nothing could be more different from the truth than that TV show. I grew up in an insane asylum, basically. But what's worse is we didn't know it was an insane asylum," he continued. I never really admitted or even knew that I was being abused or that my family was being abused because I thought it was normal. And yet, as far as the neighbors knew, the Knorr family was no different from any other. 
Not that I want to say that they were private, but they stayed to themselves, said Janet Garrett, who lived next door. It was difficult to strike up a conversation with the mother. She just didn't want to, it seemed like. You try a few times, and after two or three times, you just say, okay, you just give up. Teresa's changing behavior even went undetected by the neighborhood kids, who generally had a closer view of their friends' private lives than their parents. Not having a father figure around, that was the only thing about their family that seemed different, said Janet's son, Chris Garrett. He was the same age as Terry Knorr and went to her house to play from time to time. Once he went to her birthday party, a party at which he noticed that he was the only non-family member. Terry's mom wasn't the silent type, he recalled. In fact, she was real talkative. Kept to herself, but talkative when you talked to her. Even so, I don't remember her ever saying anything that you could call off the wall. But Terry's mom was definitely different from the other moms in the neighborhood. I'll say this about her, Garrett added. Terry's mom definitely had control of the kids. I didn't see a lot of backtalk or argument coming out of any of them. If they were told to be in by a certain time, they were in. If they were told to do something, they did it. They never asked questions. They never made a point to second-guess authority. When my mother got drunk, she used to lick the ends of steak knives, Terry recalled. Serrated edged knives, and she threw them at us to see if her aim was good. Knives weren't Teresa's only deadly playthings when she'd had a little too much to drink. Terry still blanches, remembering the chill in her mother's voice one evening when she went in to say goodnight. Eyes half closed, the mother sat in a deep chair in the living room and motioned for Terry to approach. In her drunken stupor, Teresa howled at her shivering but stoic young daughter, boasting of that defining moment nearly 15 years earlier when she pointed a gun at Clifford Sanders and pulled the trigger. She owned two guns, a Derringer and a revolver, Terry recalled. At one point, she took out the bone-handled old cowboy gun. It looked like a toy, but it was a real six-shooter, a 22 pistol. Aiming the pistol at her daughter, Teresa told Terry, I shot once and I can do it again. Terry froze, standing terrified before her. And she told me to come to her, and I did, Terry said with a shudder, remembering. And she put the gun to my head, so hard that the next morning I woke up and still had a knot from where the barrel had sunk into my temple. Teresa's children may have accepted this dictatorial isolation, but they didn't understand it. They complained about not being able to have friends over, but if they whined too much about it, they were slapped into silence. They did not see the gradual evaporation of their contact with the outside world as the logical result of shutting themselves inside the house. Instead, Teresa's children saw the neighbors distancing from their mother and themselves as indifference and an unwillingness to get involved. Our neighbors backed off, said Terry. They knew better than to mess with our family. Everybody shuts their eyes. Nobody wants to get involved. The Nor children's blind obedience to their mother stemmed from a constant state of terror that remained invisible to the Garretts and everyone else who lived along Bellingham Way. Even in the early stages, the terror was so bizarre and their mother so skilled at keeping it in the family, it would have taken more than simple curiosity on the part of the neighbors to uncover what was going on. Had the Garretts or any of the other neighbors known about it, Terry wonders even today if they would have done anything. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host, 
you can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human. Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts.